Take your Bible and turn to Philippians chapter number 4. Philippians chapter number 4. We've been going through the, through the High Five series for a while, and um, I get to preach something. I, I normally know where I'm going to be preaching for a while ahead of time. Uh, I know if there's some kind of a theme that we're going through, some type of a study that we're going through. But on this particular one, uh, I was talking with my daughter about some things a couple weeks ago, and the Holy Spirit just kind of said, you know, this is what you need to say, and, and it seemed uh, to help her, but it also reminded me of some things. So this week, um, I just, me and the Lord got together, and I had a fresh talk with him, and I want to talk about some things that I think are very uh, needful for us to hear and to understand. So I'm not going to ask you to stand in honor of reading his word, but I am going to ask you to most definitely think about these things and look at them as we go through them together. I'm going to begin in verse number four, Philippians chapter number four, Paul writing from a, not the greatest of circumstances. He was writing this from jail. And I don't mean the kind of jail that has the TV, that has the gymnasium, that has uh, three meals a day. I'm not talking about uh, with an air conditioner or a heat controlled. I'm not even talking about with, with a, a sheet or a blanket or a pillow. We're talking about the, the word that I think in the English could best be understood for where Paul would be staying. We would use the word dungeon. And, and nothing about that would, would please what we would call the, the outward of, uh, effects of us, our, our flesh, our desires. Uh, there would be nothing that we could see about that that we would look forward to it like I look forward to coming to God's house today. Nothing at all. And in the process of this, he pins a letter to the church at Philippi that I believe is one of the most beautiful letters that, that in the world today, just like it was the world in that day, we can almost get a peek from heaven. Have you ever said to yourself, I wonder what God thinks about this? Well, we can look in God's Word, and I can tell you exactly how God thinks about this. I can tell you exactly the attitudes that we should have, the stance that we should have, the beliefs that we should have, because in this particular book, the circumstances could not be worse or more bleak, but yet God's presence, God's will comes through. I think we need to hear that today. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, the Bible says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Now, how many of you love that verse? Amen? Now, I know my crowd's not as big as normal, so that means your amens have to be twice as loud. We were kidding about this and on, the, on the way to church. I said I needed one of those amen tracks and a laugh track. There you go. Record that, and we'll play that one back. The problem with that verse for many people is the word always. We have no problem rejoicing, amen? But there are times that we don't want to rejoice. There are times that we don't even think it's appropriate to rejoice. We think at that point in time it would be the, the, the normal thing is for us to look at it and look at it with respect and say, no, no, this can't be. You can't have an, have an attitude of praising God and rejoicing for your circumstances because there's nothing about the circumstances that looks good. But Paul tells us that it's irregardless of the circumstances. In all circumstances, in any situation, no matter what, rejoice. I call this a heaven perspective. God's still on the throne. If Romans 8 is true, and we know that all things work together for good, to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose, when He says all things, we need to believe all things. And all means all, and that's all all means. It means everything. No matter what, no matter if you like it, if you understand it, if you don't understand it, it doesn't matter what, rejoice because God's on the throne. Rejoice because God's with you. Rejoice because God's allowing it. And a matter of fact, though you may not see it, there is a great path to glory. There is a great time of unbelievable rejoicing and abounding in, 
and the goodness of God that you could not have had outside of those circumstances. Those circumstances are the stimulus to praise no matter what. So look what he says in verse 5. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The way that you're handling this in a godly way, let others see that. Let others know that. Trust in the Lord and walk in a certain way so that others will know that you're trusting in the Lord. Let the Lord lead you. Walk with His peace and let others see that you're walking with God's peace. He's here to handle it. The God of the universe is completely involved with your right now. With your right now. So look what it says in verse 6. Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. King James uses the word careful, but it doesn't mean the same thing as we use that word careful today. The, the new King James says anxious, but this very same word Jesus used in the Sermon on the Mount. And in the Sermon on the Mount, he's telling in uh, Matthew 6, verse uh, 25, 31, and in 34, and it, it, he's talking about circumstances, and he uses this phrase, do not worry. Same word, but it's translated, do not worry. So verse 26 to verse 30, he describes the circumstance, and he says, in these circumstances, don't worry. And the tense of it means stop it. Y'all ever said that before? That means right now, stop it. Don't do it. Then he, in verse uh, 31, he says, do not worry. Verse 32 and verse 33, he describes the circumstances. By the way, he didn't have to describe the circumstances, but he went in greater detail because they needed to know not just the truth, but the application of the truth. And then in verse 34, he says it again. Do not worry. Do you think the Lord was saying, there's something better there? Worry's not beneficial to you. Worry's not going to bless you. It's not good. You need to get away from that. You need to stop it. In these circumstances, quit it. So in verse 6 of Philippians 4, this word called worry, he says don't worry about anything. Be anxious for nothing. Stop it. Same tense. Stop it. Don't worry. Now here's where you need to listen to me. Y'all hear the roar? Can you hear me beyond the roar? All right, listen to me. Worry is played out in your emotions. And I want to talk to you a little bit about your emotions today. And I pray that you have ears to hear what God wants to say. Number one, our emotions can't distinguish between fact and fantasy. It is impossible for our emotions to declare the difference between the two. Our emotions are working no matter what. Last night, it was just Lynn and I in the house. Can you say praise God to that? It was a good time and we were there and we were uh, watching TV together. And we actually were watching a, a show that uh, was on Plex. And it, um, we, had, we, had, we weren't binging. We, were just, we only watched one show. But, but we had the whole season there available to us, and we, we decided we hadn't watched this series in a long time, so we watched the very first season one, episode one. By the way, we've already seen this, right? So we're watching it together, and, and, and we know it's not true. We're watching TV. We know it's not true, right? And there was a certain scene that came up, and my wife hit a note that the Mormon Tabernacle Choir I'm not even going to try it. I'll blow up the microphone if I do it. My wife, if you ask her to jump, she might could jump an inch. But she was sitting down on the love seat, and I think she jumped 12 inches sitting down. I mean, it just scared her to death. How many of y'all been to a scary movie? And you, you know it was a scary movie, and you were socked up, and you said, I'm not going to be scared. But you were. 
Amen? Or you have those movies or those TV shows that make you cry. And you're like, I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to cry. You're not going to see me cry. You see, even though we know it's not true, it's true to your emotions. So whether it's fact or whether it's fantasy, it's real to your emotions. All these all those things come into your life through uh, through your sensory, your ears, your eyes, your senses, and you know. It goes to the part of the brain called the medulla. It takes it to the frontal cortex where your emotions are there. And it doesn't matter if it's good or if it's bad, if it's right or if it's wrong. The emotions, that particular part of your brain, can not distinguish between the two. So number two, our emotions always follow our thoughts. The responders, they can't think for themselves. Our emotions to respond simply to what you see and what you hear. Back in the early 80s when I was in college when computers were just coming out and, and I had to take the class on programming. How many of y'all remember BASIC? Okay, and programming. And, and they, G-I-G-O, they taught us that phrase, garbage in, garbage out. If you mess it up when you're programming it, it's not going to work, right? And, but really, that's what your emotions are telling you, too. If garbage thinking goes in, garbage will come out through your emotions. If proper thinking goes in, then your emotions will react to that accordingly, and proper actions will come out. Whatever a man puts into his mind and thinks. Whatever he thinks about determines what he will feel. Number three, we can't control our emotions. We can only control our thoughts. I remember when my kids were young and something would happen to them, they'd fall down. I'd pick them up and I'd hold them and console them. And uh, how many of y'all know what I mean when I say snubbing? We had one of our children that would snub and... <laughs> and I'd say, shh, shh, it's all right. Calm down, calm down. So then what they try to do? They tried to hold their breath. <laughs> you can't control your emotions. Matter of fact, I get tired of it after a while, and I say, stop it, like that was going to help. I think that's when they started holding their breath. You see, realistic thoughts will produce realistic actions, right? But stinking thinking produces stinking actions. Proper thoughts, your emotions are okay. But all that other junk that comes in there will take you down the wrong road. So the thoughts that we constantly feed into our mind will determine our emotions and desires, which will determine our actions. Look in your Bible, Philippians 4, verse 8. From the jail cell, Paul says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Think on these things. Keep your thinking there. Remain thinking there. Meditate. Don't let your thinking go in a different directions. Any good. Any truth, anything praiseworthy. But isn't it amazing how that other junk can come in? We can put whatever we want into our minds, and our emotions will respond accordingly. Fearful thoughts will make you tense up and tighten up. 
well, I'm not picking on Lynn. This is just as much me as it is her. But how many times I, I, I've been sitting on the couch watching TV with her, and all of a sudden the grip will, she'll begin to tense up. My hand will go, ow, ow, ow. You see, those fearful things will come when the fearful will tense up. I'm watching a show, and there's a chase scene. This car is going there, where that car is. And all of a sudden, my heart's going, right? Just simply because that's the thoughts that I had. Angry, hurtful thoughts will always produce irrational, bad reactions. Prideful thoughts will produce selfish actions. We need to be very cautious of what we're putting into our mind to think about. Number four, it is absolutely critical to have thoughts of truth rather than thoughts of error. Absolutely critical. How do you do it, preacher? How do you, how do you control your emotions? Stop the stinking thinking, the wrong thoughts, and replace it with truth. Now this is, it's amazing to me that something can happen to a person when they're five years old that will produce a, a, a hurt in the emotion that it, it will be there, there will be pain, and it will be sketched into our memory. 30, 40, 50, 60 years will go by and they'll think about something that happened when they're five years old. Listen to me now. And their feelings will be just as alive 30, 40, 50, 60 years later. They're feeling the same thing. They're having the same hurt. They're having the, maybe someone said something that just crushed their spirit. All those years later, when they know better, they still feel just as crushed, just as hurt, just as painful, listen to me now, or just as panicked. That's our emotions. That's our emotions. And going unchecked, it will continue that way. By the way, that not only happens in the past, but it also will happen into the future. We have some thinking not based upon truth, not based upon fact, and we begin to immediately project into the future. And we just understand everything that's going to happen. All the preconceptions that we might have, listen to me now, all the speculations on what someone else is thinking, what someone else is going to do, and it hasn't even been lived yet, but in our emotions, it's fact. Can I get a great big, that's ridiculous? <coughs> I mean, that makes no sense whatsoever. Why in the world would we allow things that happened yesterday affect our today? Why in the world will we act as if we know the facts about tomorrow based upon our speculations of today? Beware of those things. It is absolutely critical to have thoughts of truth, not your perception of truth, but thoughts of truth rather than thoughts of error. John chapter 8, Jesus said this. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. If you abide, in my truth, in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth. You know where I'm going with this, don't you? And the truth shall make you free. You'll know the truth. You'll abide in the truth. And the truth will set you free. You don't need to live in the bondage of yesterday. You don't need to have those chains, listen, chained today for projection of the future. God's got, He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is 
omnipresent. Ten billion years ago, God was in present tense. Today, He's in present tense. Throughout all of eternity, He will be in present tense. Nothing's going to catch Him by surprise. And we call Him Lord. We call Him Master. We want to be led by the Spirit of God. That same Spirit that is as much God as the Father and the Son. And He lives within us to lead us into all truth. And he said, as long as you have the Spirit of God, you don't need all that other stuff. He will lead you into truth. The war between truth and error began in the Garden of Eden. I don't know how long Adam and Eve were there before the fall, before chapter 3 of Genesis. It could have been a lot of, a lot of good days. Could you imagine walking with God? I mean, a presence like He came in the cool of the evening to walk with them. Wow. That's a, a theophany. An Old Testament time when, when God shows up right there with them. How glorious that would be. And listen, to live a life with no guilt. To live a life without any damage or harm. To live a life to love God with all your heart and soul, mind, and strength all the time. To love that, the one with you as much as you love yourself. What a, what a wonderful life that would be. By the way, it's coming back. It's called heaven. But in that day, they had it. And then God, God only had gave them one rule to follow. Can, can, I, can I teach you something here? Because there was only one rule to follow, but there was one rule to follow, that tells me God determines good and evil, truth and error. It is in reaction to His truth. Not what I think, what God says. Not what someone else speculates, what God says. So someone else came in to the picture. I mean, they had it as long as they obeyed God, but someone else messed it up by coming into the picture and told them something. Hey, you can have the fruit of this. You can be like God. It, what, you won't die. And when Adam broke that one rule, he was acting like God and that he could determine between right and wrong. It was death to him, and it's been death to us ever since. Well, I know what God's Word says, but hold on now. Yes, I, I, I know what the preacher said, but you don't know how I feel. You know how many times I've tried to counsel with people and help people and they say you don't know how I feel and I want to shake them and say you don't know how God feels God wants to bless you and you're tying his hands you're not allowing him because you're you're hanging on and holding on to lies rather than the truth since the fall man's been man in essence has been choosing between right and wrong this is the ultimate error the lie against God's truth John 3.16 is truth, folks. But some people believe the lie rather than the truth. That he will not leave us or forsake us. It's truth. But some people believe the lie. I can't pray. My prayers aren't getting through. I feel like God's a million miles away. I said it once. I'll say it again. Romans 8.28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. It is truth whether your feelings feel it or not. Satan wants everyone to, he wants to convince everyone to follow the lie. Listen to me now, to follow the counterfeit rather than the truth. His tool is our emotions. Those Emotions will be based on truth or a lie. They'll either set you free or put you in chains. We've got to look at the Word of God. 
We've got to look through here and look past the words and see the nature of an almighty God. In the beginning, was, it was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You can see the nature of God as He shows Himself to us. I love Amos. Y'all know where I'm going with this. I, I love Amos because he talks about the plumb line. I love the plumb line of truth. Now, you might look at that differently, and you might want to change that plumb line to, to, to ease up and be like you. Doesn't work that way. The plumb line is always plumb. Amen? Come on. Where you, whether you look at it and say, no, no, I think, I don't know, I think, no, it doesn't matter. You go to the plumb line and you change to it. You don't expect it to change to you. You go to the truth of God and you, you change to it. Don't expect it to change to you. I wrote some things down. Satan says, Seek success at any price. The world amens that. God says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Satan says, Seek riches at any cost. The world says, Finances and money will bless you. God says, Do not lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. It's Matthew 6, 19. Matthew 6, 20. He says, But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. Satan says, be popular. Push ahead. God says, if anyone wishes to follow me, he must deny himself. Truth. Satan says, you won't ever be happy unless. I can't be happy unless. I can't be happy unless. God says, well, by, matter of fact, Paul said from a jail in Philippians, in this same fourth chapter in the 11th verse, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. That tells me my happiness is not based on circumstances, it's based on God. Satan says, eat, drink, and be, demer and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Jesus said to Satan in Matthew 4, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's where we need to find our truth. Satan says, if it feels good, what do, you, do it. If it feels good, do it. Jesus said to the Father, not my will, thy will be done. Satan says, boy, he is shouting this today. Everything's relative. Everything's relative. Jesus said in John 17, 17, your word is truth. And anybody who wants to tell you, well, it's your truth. No, the plumb line says it's God's truth. We got to live by the plumb line, folks. Go back in Philippians 4, look in verse 6. After he says, be anxious for nothing, stop worrying, stop it. He says, but in everything... I believe he means everything, don't you? I don't care what you're feeling in your emotions. I don't care how it has turned you upside down. He says, even in those things by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. You go to God in prayer. Take your need to the Lord. You, you do supplication. You, you intercede on the behalf of someone else in behalf of that circumstance. But in the process, don't you come with your lack of faith. Don't you come with your stinking thinking. You give Him praise. You thank God that no matter what, hey, God, I'm bringing this to you because you offer it to me, but I'm just grateful that you're on the throne. I'm grateful that your word is real to me. I'm grateful that this world does not dictate my happiness, but it flows directly from the throne of God for me. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And when you do so, here's another truth. Verse 7, and the peace of God, I feel it in my body right now at this moment, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your minds 
through Christ Jesus. That's your emotions. We need to let the truth of God be the truth of our minds. We need to let the love of God be the love in our hearts. We need to bow before Him in praise. The world's going crazy. The world's going crazy. Pastor, do you not believe all the things that's being said out there? All I know is I don't know. And my Word of God tells me to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. The Word of God tells me that God's got me. I'll say it a different way. God's got it. Whatever your it is, God's got it. Please hear this. God wants you. God wants you. If you don't know Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, that's where it all begins, with a personal, intimate relationship with Him. Give your heart, give your thoughts, give your life to Him. There are too many people that have joined a concept rather than joining a person. There are too many people that have joined a church or joined Christianity but have never been introduced to an interpersonal relationship and called Jesus their Savior, listen to me now, and Lord and Master. And you can tell when the crushing of life and circumstances begins, the reactions will tell you whether they're believing in a concept or a person. A concept won't bless you. You can quote this from front to back, but unless you know the author, you're out of luck. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. He wants to bless. Church members, it's time to move from where we are to where He is in every aspect of our life. Do you think He deserves some praise today? Do you think He needs, deserves some true worship today? He's got the whole world in His hands. He's got the whole world in his hands, he's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. Come on now. He got the tiny little babies. In his hands, he's got the tiny little babies. In his hands, he's got the tiny little babies. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got you and me, brother. In his hands, he's got you and me, brother. In his hands, he's got you and me, brother. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. If I don't quit, I'm going to be doing this for a while. <laughs> Amen. It's time to give him praise, folks. He is worthy of our praise. I'm going to say one last thing, and we're going to give the invitation, and I pray that you hear this. It's not original by, my, by me, by no means. Fear is a liar. Let's pray. Father, may fear and faith never be said to coexist together because we know that they can't. Father, I thank you that you are the Lord of all. And Father, if there's anyone here that is in this building or anyone that is watching online, if they do not know you in a personal way, and, and they know whether they do or don't, they know what it means to have you speaking to them and whispering love and, and overflowing them with your riches of your grace. They know whether it's a concept or if it's you, Jesus. So Father, may they repent of the sin that separates. May they come to you. And Lord, ask you to do for them what only you, they, only you can do. May they give their heart and their life, their thoughts, their minds. May they give their all unto you. May they call you Lord. May they call you Master. May they call you Savior. May they not hold back but give you everything. And Lord, 
Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So hear their prayers. That's what the truth of God's word says. But Lord, there are many people that are listening to my voice now that have been quite afraid of things that are happening in their today or maybe some fears and some, some stinking thinking of things that happened yesterday that they're reliving in their emotions over and over again or they're afraid of what could happen tomorrow, even death. Father, you're the Lord of life and you are the Lord of death. You're the Lord of all. So Lord, may we not worry about preoccupations for tomorrow or speculations of what could happen, but Lord, just trust in you with all of our heart. Lean not into our own understanding, but in all ways acknowledge you and let you, my Lord, my Savior, let you direct our path. Father, may this invitation, whether it's in this building or wherever someone is watching us now live or on replay, Father, may your will and only your will be done. Holy Spirit, speak as only you can. Call us to yourself. And, sir, we will give you praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.